Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video and the next, we're going to be doing a very basic overview of pulmonary pharmacology. Now in this video specifically, we're going to be talking about the drugs that affect mainly the basic metabolism and basic biosignaling pathways. In other words, the pathways that don't have to do directly with inflammation or the immune system. In the next video, we'll still be doing pulmonary pharmacology, but we'll be looking at the drugs that do affect the immune system and inflammation directly. Now, you're welcome to skip this initial part of the video, but what we want to do first is really talk about the normal events of these biosignaling pathways, what happens without pharmacological intervention. And the two receptors that we're going to be looking at here are the beta-2 receptor, which is an adrenergic receptor, normally considered for epinephrine, and then over here we have the acetylcholine receptor. Now this one specifically is a muscarinic receptor, not nicotinic. Both of these receptors are what we call G-protein coupled receptors, meaning on their cytoplasmic side, as you see right here, they're coupled to G-proteins. Now for the beta-2 receptor specifically, it normally would bind a catecholamine such as epinephrine, also called adrenaline. And when epinephrine binds to this receptor, it's actually going to trigger one of these subunits of the G protein to dissociate from the beta-2 receptor, and it will move along the membrane, as you see here, and bind to and activate this enzyme, which is also embedded in the membrane, and this is called adenylate cyclase. So when adenylate cyclase becomes activated by G-alpha here, it converts ATP into cyclic AMP, a second messenger here. Now cyclic AMP normally is going to activate this enzyme called protein kinase A, and then protein kinase A will then trigger a phosphorylation cascade. In the case of the pulmonary system, this cascade leads to really two things. One is smooth muscle relaxation, which directly leads to bronchodilation, so opening of the airways. If we think about epinephrine, epinephrine is normally associated with a sympathetic response, fight or flight. If we're exercising or running away from a bear that's going to maul us, right, we need our airways open as much as possible to get air in and out right, because our muscles and everything's going to need more oxygen, we're building up more waste products with exercise, and so we're getting rid of more CO2, so we got to have these airways open. So it makes sense that epinephrine would trigger smooth muscle relaxation, which would cause bronchodilation. Now one other important thing here that I want to mention is that cyclic AMP, being a small molecule, also has to have a way to be degraded. And it's degraded through this enzyme right here, which is sometimes just called a phosphodiesterase, more specifically cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. And so this enzyme breaks down cyclic AMP into adenosine monophosphate, or AMP, which is inactive. Okay? So ultimately what cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase does is it limits the amount of bronchodilation, right? Because if we have less cyclic AMP because it's being degraded, then there's less activation of this phosphorylation cascade and therefore less bronchodilation. In a couple of minutes, we'll actually see a medication that affects this enzyme to produce more bronchodilation. Now this other pathway over here is going to do the exact opposite normally. So this is an acetylcholine receptor, specifically muscarinic. And this is actually a receptor that is activated by the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10, and some of the branches of it actually have direct contacts to the lungs, and they release acetylcholine, which binds to this acetylcholine receptor. And so you can see that acetylcholine right here, and it binds to the acetylcholine receptor. Now this is also a G-protein coupled receptor. You can see the G-protein complex here. Uh, the alpha subunit's actually given a slightly different name here for whatever reason. It's not important. But essentially when acetylcholine binds to that receptor, the same kind of thing happens. That activating subunit is going to translocate over to this enzyme right here. This enzyme is phospholipase C, and it activates it. Now, situated in the plasma membrane is a phospholipid. This is a normal constituent of plasma membranes. It's called PIP2, also called phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate. Now, when activated, phospholipase C is going to catalyze the breakdown of PIP2 into two molecules. One of them is diacylglycerol, also called DAG. This actually remains in the membrane because it is a lipid, and it actually can recruit other proteins itself. But what's important here is that IP3, or inositol trisphosphate, is released into the cytoplasm. 
This IP3 is going to trigger a phosphorylation cascade, but as you can see down here, it has the exact opposite effect of cyclic AMP. So IP3 is actually going to trigger smooth muscle contraction or constriction, which leads to bronchoconstriction. If you think about acetylcholine being released by the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve is a major player in the parasympathetic nervous system, so rest and digest. If we're just sitting on the couch not doing anything, we don't need our airways to be open so much, right? So acetylcholine here is going to promote them to close down. Not totally, of course, but it's going to promote their constriction. So now that we understand the basic biosignaling here, let's take a look at some of the specific types of drugs that are going to be able to affect different parts of these pathways. The first class that we're going to look at are what are called the methyl xanthines. Now, the most common methyl xanthine that you've probably seen or heard of is caffeine. Of course, caffeine is contained in things like energy drinks, in coffee. Now, caffeine itself is not used in traditional pharmacological treatment. This is more recreational. But what is important is that these methyl xanthines inhibit the enzyme cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. Now, what would be the effect of inhibiting this enzyme? Well, what does the enzyme normally do? The enzyme normally degrades cyclic AMP. So it creates less cyclic AMP. Well, if cyclic AMP leads to bronchodilation and there's less cyclic AMP, that means less bronchodilation. Well, if our overall goal was to increase the amount of bronchodilation, to increase the airway flow to the lungs, then it would make sense to inhibit this enzyme. Because by inhibiting this enzyme, we prevent cyclic AMP from being degraded and therefore preserve more cyclic AMP, so more bronchodilation. Now the two specific methyl xanthines that would be used would be theophylline or theophylline. This would be used more in an outpatient long-term setting. And then there's aminophylline or aminophylline, which would be more an inpatient short-term setting. But methyl xanthines are not used very often. They would be used mainly if the other drugs that we'll talk about in a few minutes don't work or for some reason are contraindicated. And one of the reasons that they're not used as much is because they have a really narrow therapeutic index. So there's a very small window between where they're therapeutic and where they're toxic. Um, and some of the side effects that you'll see with excessive amounts of these would be persistent vomiting, arrhythmias, which is obviously not good, and then intractable seizures. So again, these are not used a whole lot, although obviously caffeine is used recreationally. But the amounts of caffeine that most people normally intake are not enough to cause these kinds of side effects. And as I mentioned, uh, the methyl xanthines are rarely used in the treatment of asthma, although sometimes they are. They're not used in COPD. We're going to see some drugs that are used in both COPD and asthma, but methyl xanthines, although it's rare, can be used in asthma, but not COPD. The next class of drugs are those that bind to and activate the beta-2 receptor. These would be beta-2 agonists, and there's really three types. There's the SABAs, there's the LABAs, and then there's non-selectives. So the SABAs are short-acting beta agonists. That's what that stands for. And the main one that we'll look at is albuterol. Now, when you think of the short-acting beta agonists, these are basically your rescue inhalers. So not only are they short-acting, but they're also rapid-acting. So if somebody is having an acute asthma attack, the rescue inhaler is what you want to use because even though it doesn't last long, its onset is very quick. Then we have the LABAs, the long-acting beta agonists. The two best examples are salmeterol and formoterol. Formoterol is probably the more common of the two. Now, the LABAs are, as they suggest, long-acting. However, unlike the SABAs, they are slow onset. And so actually the LABAs have a black box warning. Uh, and it has to do that in the past there's been risk of death with an asthma attack. So if you have an acute asthma attack, do you want to use a LABA? No because they are slow onset. So if somebody's having an acute asthma attack and their bronchioles are constricted, then this LABA would not be indicated. In fact, it would be contraindicated because it's so slow acting that it's not going to open the airways in time and the person will very likely die as a result of the asthma attack if it's severe enough. So that's why for an asthma attack that's acute, we want a rescue inhaler. If somebody has chronic asthma, then we probably would prescribe a LABA because it's long acting even though it is slow onset, although the person should carry with them a short acting beta agonist. The LABAs are often co-prescribed with an inhaled corticosteroid. We'll be talking about corticosteroids in the next video. The SABAs are not.
Now, the Sabas and the Labas collectively are what we call the selective sympathomimetics uh, because these selectively bind to the beta-2 receptor. They don't bind to the beta-1, and they don't bind to alpha receptors. So that implies the existence of the non-selectives. The non-selectives are, are drugs that don't just bind to the beta-2 receptor. They also bind to the beta-1, the alpha, and so they tend to have more widespread effects. Uh, one of those is actually epinephrine, so straight up epinephrine, the actual drug that I showed you on one of the previous slides. So epinephrine can actually bind to multiple adrenergic receptors. It can bind to the beta-2, but also beta-1 and the alpha receptors. Um, epinephrine is normally used whenever there's anaphylaxis, so you've heard of an EpiPen. So it's used to treat anaphylaxis and acute bronchospasm. So that's your EpiPen. That's the most common of these three that's used. Then we also have ephedrine and isoproteinerol. These both bind to both the beta-1 and the beta-2 receptors, um, and they're rarely used in asthma. Um, so probably don't have to worry about these too much. And again, they're rarely used because there's a wide array of side effects, and also uh, probably only if the other drugs were contraindicated for some reason, but again, that is rare. Now considering the beta-2 receptor here, what overall effects would they have? Well, if they're binding to and agonizing the beta-2 receptor, then all of this stuff is going to be enhanced. So we're going to have more cyclic AMP, more of this phosphorylation cascade, more smooth muscle relaxation, and more bronchodilation. Okay? So that's pretty straightforward. Now, these drugs are used in both asthma and COPD. I think the asthma makes sense. You've got acute closure of the airways. You need to get them opened up. For COPD, it's more for symptom management. It's definitely not a cure for COPD. In fact, there is no cure for COPD, so only symptom management. Now, the next class of drugs is what we call the anti-muscarinics. So we talked about this acetylcholine receptor over here. So anti-muscarinics means they're going to block this receptor or they're going to antagonize it. And the main anti-muscarinic drug is ipratropium. Now, in terms of how these drugs affect this pathway, well, remember what the normal function of the pathway is. Acetylcholine will bind here, and it will trigger the production of IP3, and then you get bronchoconstriction. So if you have an antagonist to this receptor, can acetylcholine bind? No, acetylcholine can't bind. And so is there going to be as much of this phospholipase C activation? No, there's going to be less, and so there's going to be less IP3, and so less bronchoconstriction. And so by antagonizing this receptor, you basically block the contraction of the airway smooth muscle, which means less constriction and so more in the direction of dilation. It doesn't cause dilation, it just produces less constriction. And then it also blocks the increase in the secretion of mucus in response to vagal activity. So the vagus nerve also has some other effects at the lungs by causing it to secrete mucus. The mucus would be designed to trap foreign invaders and things like that that could produce an infection, right? Well, that mucus also is going to reduce the amount of air that can get in and out of the lungs. So if we block the production of that mucus, then we also will help air get in and out of the lungs. Okay, So we block this receptor, we get less constriction, and so that keeps the airways from closing. And with the anti-muscarinic drugs, again like the beta agonists, it's used in both asthma and COPD. However, with COPD in the same way, these are just used for symptom management. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the drug classes that affect the pulmonary system without directly affecting inflammation. In the next video, we're going to go over the drug classes that do have an effect on inflammation in the immune system, so make sure to join us there. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.